thank all of you for having me here today. I'm truly honored to be speaking in this lecture series, which is making quite a name for itself in the uh, economics profession. I'll try to live up to the standards that have been set by the past uh, distinguished speakers that have uh, appeared in this series. My topic today examines the economics of moral imperatives, <clears throat> more specifically as it applies to environmental issues. Now the yardstick most widely used by economists to evaluate public policy is what we refer to as economic efficiency, and that is that the marginal social benefits of a particular policy must outweigh its marginal social costs and therefore do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Now when measured by this yardstick, however, a great deal of public policy fails the test. Frequently, even with the very best of intent, politicians, bureaucrats, administ and administrators pass legislation and regulations whose costs far outweigh their benefits and in many instances actually end up harming the very populations they were designed to help. Now public debate over economic policies whose costs outweigh their benefits invariably turn to moral issues. If you can't make an efficiency argument, the argument is invariably, well, this is the right thing to do. Advocates of such policies frequently contend that regardless of cost, their proposed policy is the moral or the right thing to do. For example, Carol Browner, head of the United States Environmental Protection Agency under the Clinton administration proposed the stringent new federal environmental regulations PM 2.5, which by her own admission, and this is a quote, may have cost more than the potential environmental benefits that it provided. President Clinton supported the regulations publicly acknowledging that even though the costs might be greater than the benefits, it was the moral or the quote, right thing to do. Now, aside from the ir uh, obvious irony of having someone like Bill Clinton tell Americans what is moral, there are genuine legal issues involved here. Many key government regulators are constrained by legislation which actually prohibits considerations of cost in their decision making. For example, under the Clean Air Act, the EPA must set health-based standards for air quality without regard to the potential expense of meeting those standards. That's the law and there's no way around it. We've got no choice. In the extreme cases, some environmental groups publicly contend that doing anything that harms the environment is immoral. For example, in addressing environmental regulations, the United Methodist Church in America has published the following statement. The United Methodist Church believes that public health hazards to future generations such as toxic substances and wastes must be permitted. In order to fulfill God's commandment to love our neighbors as ourselves, we should support action to protect each individual's health at all costs. Other interest groups contend that America, as a moral and decent nation, has a moral imperative to protect and or clean up the environment regardless of the costs involved. For example, the United States Department of Energy gave the following testimony before Congress. The department's costs for environmental remediation work were significantly higher than industry norms. Our environmental restoration projects, for example, cost 32% more than private sector projects and 5% more than other government agencies. However, we're directing we're redirecting the national commitment that built the most powerful weapons the world has ever known towards addressing uh, the resulting widespread environmental and safety problems at thousands of contaminated sites across the country. We have a moral obligation to do no less, and we are committed to producing meaningful results regardless of cost. Now that, of course, is testimony taken from the Federal Register where the um, Energy Department is asking for a new budget. The economic issues involving moral imperatives, or the primary economic issue uh, involving moral imperatives, is that it, they openly ignore the opportunity cost of the decision involved. Now, economists define the opportunity cost of a decision 
as many of you know, as the value of the highest valued foregone alternative. In other words, you, what you've got to give up when you make a decision. Interestingly enough, however, those who want to make choices based upon moral imperatives, which ignore opportunity costs, usually produce more immoral outcomes in the process. Now, the classic lifeboat example from the sinking of an ocean liner makes this point most clearly. The lifeboat can only hold so many survivors. Rescuing more swimmers than the capacity of the boat can cost the lives of all those already saved. Therefore, if you want to make a moral argument, how moral is it to attempt to save one more life and lose the lives of many others in the process? Unfortunately, every choice, regardless of its moral dimension, has an opportunity cost. And opportunity costs have both moral and frequently mortal consequences. Whenever debate over public policy involves a moral issue, genuine morality requires doing the greatest good for the greatest number by considering the marginal social benefits and the marginal social costs of those social choices. Efforts to cloud the issue with emotional appeals to moral imperatives can and frequently do produce outcomes which are neither efficient nor moral. Now, Americans generally contend, at least outwardly, that individual lives are priceless. Sounds good, feels good. I've said that before. You've probably said that before. Anytime someone says that, you're probably nodding your head like, hey, that's, that's the way it ought to be. But frequently, we engage in public sector efforts that spare no expense to save even one life in the belief that we have an, a moral obligation to save lives. This value system is reflected in many American endeavors, from the rescue policy of the Federal Park Service and the U.S. Coast Guard, to environmental regulations, medical care for the indigent, and it is an unending list of public sector efforts driven by that argument. But economists know, however, that the most important cost of attempting to save lives can and frequently does increase the number of people who die. Public policy and regulation can and does kill people. So let us look at several ways in which public sector expenditures and regulations can, in fact, increase the number of lives lost. If we accept the position that we have a moral obligation to save lives at any cost, then let us examine here today just how doing so can be even more immoral. Now, there are at least three ways that lives are lost through public sector choices. The first is by ignoring the opportunity cost of the choice. The second is by lowering incomes and living standards in the United States through regulation and legislation. And the third is overlooking the secondary human effects of legislation and regulation. That is, how human beings respond to those, that legislation and those regulations in the long run. First, ignoring opportunity costs. Every choice has an opportunity cost, so resources devoted to one type of public sector effort to save lives cannot simultaneously be devoted to another. More specifically, a dollar spent enforcing environmental laws means a dollar less spent on enforcing criminal laws or any other alternative use in the public sector. Therefore, allocating public sector resources to save lives without considering the opportunity cost of the effort frequently kills more people than economic efficiency would require. For example, let's assume for a moment that you agree with the position that environmental standards and regulations are a moral attempt to save lives. It's the right thing to do. Well, a Harvard study of the cost uh, of environmental regulations conducted by Dr. Tammy Tings has reported that spending $653 billion, that's B, billion, uh, on the implementation of the dichloropropane water standard would save an estimated one life. I'm guessing that most of you have no idea what in, wor what in the world a dichloropropane water standard is. Nor did I. Nor do most Americans. But we have spent big money on it to save small numbers of lives in the past. If approximately the same expenditure was spent on, for example, building prisons in the United States, an additional 26,320 
felons could be incarcerated, preventing an estimated 1,034 murders. We would net 1,033 lives, and in addition, in the, in the bargain, we'd avoid an additional 586 rapes, 7,711 robberies, 658 kidnappings, 1,191 other sexual assaults, and 22,680 violent crimes. Sounds good. Let's see where it goes. Another conclusion of the Ting study is that while the EPA spends on average about $7.8 million for each year of life, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration spends 100 times less for each year of life saved, or about $78,000 per year of life saved. Therefore, the obvious question is, which is the more moral choice? To save one life or 1,034 lives at the same cost with public policy. Now the area of environmental regulations is replete with easy targets for such comparisons as this. The Harvard study found that 60,000 lives are lost unnecessarily each year because of current environmental regulations. Ting summarizes this with a statement that the introductory economic student can easily understand. When we spend resources on interventions that save lives at a high cost, we have to forego the opportunity to spend those same resources on interventions that save lives at a low cost. At our current level of resource consumption, we could double the survival benefits of our current expenditures, or alternatively, we could retain the present level of risk, let the current number of people die, and save billions of dollars in the process. Now, let's consider a couple of alternative spending patterns for environmental regulations and other public expenditures. A Cato Institute study reports that spent spending $19,000 directly on medical intervention can save on the average one life year, one year of human life. Instead of spending $163,200,000 to avert one death under the benzene standard, we could save 8,090 lives with direct medical inter intervention. That's about one quarter of 1% of what it would cost the EPA to save that same year of life. Instead of spending 92 billion, 69 million, 700,000, well, that's a lot of zeros. 92 billion, 69 million, 700,000 dollars to avert one death under the Altrazine Alcor let me pronounce Altrazine Alcor drinking water standard. We could quadruple research funding at the National Cancer Institutes for the next 12 years, saving lives easily estimated in the thousands. Now the list of studies dealing with these comparative public sector issues numbers in the hundreds, and the opportunities for saving lives numbers at least 60,000 in the Ting study alone. The number of potential uh, lives saved by carefully considering the opportunity cost of public sector expenditures and regulations is really very large indeed. However, those choices are made in the political arena and they're subject to political considerations which seldom have much to do with economic reality nor with saving lives. Let's take a look at what the, the, Harvard, uh, the folks at Harvard got to say. John Graham and his associates at the Harvard Center for Risk Analysis have spent decades calculating how government regulations should be crafted to save the most lives. Graham has watched almost in disbelief as the government's poured resources into fighting minor risks. Alar is out, cyclamate may be back. As we saw with crime, one problem is headline hysteria. The politicians act when the public is frightened. The public is frightened by what it sees in the press. What is news is not necessarily the biggest public health problem. The mysterious, the bizarre, the speculative make good news. But the day-to-day -day problems people have in traffic crashes as they end up in the emergency room, thousands of Americans every day, that is the kind of problem that we need to get attention to, but that the media doesn't have a hook to sell it. What really saves lives, say Graham and others, are simple things like smoke detectors, better crash protectors on highways. We're just painting more lines in the middle of the road. 
boring remedies for ordinary problems. But money spent here would save far more lives than spending billions on things like asbestos removal. There are so many hazardous chemicals and pesticides in the environment now that virtually every human being in the world is affected by them. Scientists say many of our fears about chemicals are ridiculous. But just because scientists now can find microscopic quantities of poisons doesn't mean that those tiny doses hurt people. The evidence on pesticide residues on food as a health problem is virtually non-existent. It's speculation. But wait a second. Everyone knows we're in the midst of a cancer epidemic. Cancer rates are skyrocketing. Well, again, what everyone knows is simply wrong. Some cancer rates, like lung cancer, have increased, mainly because so many Americans took up smoking in the 40s and 50s. But other cancers, like uterine and stomach cancer, have gone down. Overall, cancer rates have stayed relatively level, say epidemiologists and cancer specialists at the National Cancer Institute, the American Cancer Society, Harvard, Yale, the Mayo Clinic, and elsewhere. More cancers are recorded now because we have better early detection. And today, more people live long enough to get cancer. But all the experts say there's no epidemic. And while it pays to be cautious about industrial chemicals, the public's fears are way out of proportion. Why not try to get rid of every bit of risk we can? I want zero risk. In my life, my daughters, my wife, we all want zero risk. The problem is if every citizen in this country demands zero risk, we would bankrupt the country. Ralph Nader says every school bus should have seat belts. $1,800 more per bus to equip a bus with seat belts is a pretty good protection. That makes sense. We require belts in cars, why not buses? But when the Harvard School of Public Health analyzed the benefits of belts on school buses, they concluded belts weren't worth the cost. Kids are much more likely to be killed getting off a bus. Inside the bus, they're relatively safe. But given that it might save a dozen lives over the years, why not spend the money on the seatbelts? You're engaging in statistical murder. When you decide to spend $50 million to save a few lives, when you could spend the $50 million to save 100 lives or 1,000 lives, that's a case of statistical murder. Consider this. Some safety regulations may even kill more people than they save. Some consumer groups want the Federal Aviation Administration to require infant seats for children under two. If we buckle our children up at 50 miles per hour, why not at 550 miles per hour? Why not? One reason is that if I can't put my baby in my lap, it means I have to buy another ticket. This makes flying more expensive. Flying is much safer than driving, so if flying costs more, that family will then be more likely to choose to drive than to fly. And that will be an increase in danger to that family. So this would be a rule that would kill people. It would result in more people being killed from driving than would have been saved uh, on the airplanes. So far, most of Congress apparently believes that critics like Graham are right. The bill hasn't passed. But comparisons like that are rarely made. People say, how dare you consider cost? OK. Now, let's talk a little bit about how regulations lower living standards and increase the death toll. Regulations themselves can be fatal because lowering living standards can and does increase mortality rates. More specifically, recent studies by Jeffries, Shanahan, and Thayer have reported that for every $7.5 million in cost the government imposes on the economy through regulations, overall working standards are lowered enough to produce one additional statistical death. Now, when this formula is used to compare the number of lives saved by a particular environmental regulation with the number of lives lost through lowering living standards, it turns out that many regulations actually increase the death toll. For example, <clears throat> the EPA reports that spending $178 million uh, may avert one death under the diethyl stibesterol cattle feed ban, but we find that 24 other lives are lost due to the lowering living standards of the regulatory burden placed on the economy. Spending $111 million may avert one death under the asbestos 
the asbestos ban, but 15 other lives are lost through lowering living standards that the ban produces. Spending $72 million may avert one death under the uranium mill tailings cover rule, but 10 other lives are lost to lowering living standards. Is it moral then to save one life with legislation when you could save 10 lives by simply doing nothing, not legislating? And would it make any sense to continue to produce legislation that does just that? Now, let's look at secondary effects, how human beings respond. Whoops. Okay. The number of potential lives saved by carefully considering the opportunity costs of regulations as well as their effects on living standards are large indeed. But these public, uh, this is public policy and it's subject to short-term political considerations which don't have much to do with economic efficiency at all. Frequently, regulatory policy sounds good, feels good, but it just doesn't work or it does not work as well as other less politically attractive alternatives. Even with the best of intent, politicians frequently attempt to save lives with regulations immediately and at all costs, and the secondary effects of the longer term increases in the death toll occur primarily after the next, ele next election, which is what's important. In the political world, you have to be able to show that you've done something in order to earn the voters' votes. And le letting some mountain climber die frozen on the front of the Rockies in front of the news cameras is not going to get you any votes. <laughs> so you've got a strong incentive to spend whatever it takes to go collect some fool off the front of the mountain. However, in the long run, that tends to increase the death toll. One example of this kind of feel-good legislation that we've talked about here, which failed to consider secondary effects, involved automobile airbags, one of the darlings of American automobile industry. Over 30 years ago, auto manufacturers clearly and documentably reported to the federal government that they were costly, saved very few, if any, documentable lives, and could, in fact, increase injuries or even cause deaths. However, to save consumers from themselves, federal regulations were set in place requiring these products in new automobiles. Now, while many consumers may feel safer with these devices, we find very few documentable cases of lives actually saved. The current conventional wisdom is that Mercedes has documented one over the years and Volvo has documented one, and the others have been attempts at documentation but have failed. However, currently 99 children have been killed by the devices and hundreds of smaller adults have been injured by airbags. New car buyers are now forced to buy Generation 2 airbags, which cost about $900, and about which the National Highway Traffic Safety Agency admits, and I quote, these may not be any better, but at least you can turn them off. Most importantly, however, Airbags illustrate this third type of problem with regulations, and that is that of secondary human responses. How do human beings respond to having airbags in their car? Well, Peterson, Hoffner, and Milner, in a large-scale study of auto insurance claims, examined the safety record on automobile airbags. And they found that drivers, after purchasing the equipment, on average, drive more aggressively and as a group are more likely to be injured or killed than those without airbags. This same effect, this secondary effect of human response, has been most prevalent in large SUVs. If any of you own Hummers or Escalades or have followed that at all, as these new supersized SUVs came online, a great many people bought them and it gives a feeling of trucking around in a big, powerful, comfortable, safe vehicle. Well, as you probably are aware, the insurance rates on those vehicles have skyrocketed because they have an inordinately larger uh, frequency of turnovers and uh, accidents than non-SUV and not even the smaller SUV vehicles. So human beings do respond in the long run uh, 
and not always as we would like for them to or as we think would be appropriate. Now, in addition to airbags, there's many relevant situations where public policy has been predicated upon the implicit, implicit assumption of zero behavioral responses on the part of the public. Peltzman's research on the relationship between automobile safety regulation and increased auto deaths offers an analogy here. Sam Peltzman has reported that in response to public policy requiring auto safety devices, drivers exercise less caution and deaths, auto deaths rise, bringing renewed calls for even more auto safety devices. In the long run, consumers impute this supposed increased safety factor into their driving behavior and as a group have more accidents and the number of lives lost increases. Those of you who are students of economics uh, may have by now heard of the infamous Gordon Tullock hypothesis, which gave rise to this uh, uh, well-known cartoon by Herman, where Tullock contends, Tullock was an economist at Virginia Tech, he contended that if Peltzman is right, perhaps we could save more lives by replacing the automobile airbag with a sharp dagger pointed directly at the driver's chest. Um, Although this was meant in humor, as an objective scientist, I'm puzzled as to whether smaller adults would prefer being impaled on the dagger or beheaded by the airbag. Uh, Russell Sobel, a colleague of mine uh, and friend of uh, Dr. Padilla's as well at West Virginia University, has become somewhat famous for an article he published last year in the Southern Economic Journal uh, analyzing the safety effects in NASCAR. It's got really rock solid empirical results indicating that with each new generation of safety devices required, developed and required into NASCAR vehicles, and there have been many over the last 20 years, that drivers immediately begin to drive faster, take more chances, and push that new safety device to its limits which in fact has produced the increased crashes and deaths within NASCAR. The safer they build them, the faster they drive them. Now you could make an argument, and I, I, I offered this argument, that that's professional racing and that's professional risk taking and you would think that maybe that might be different from basic human responses. But the strength of the responses in that study are very similar to what we see in Peltzman's work the, the insurance studies on SUVs and um, the uh, Hoffer study as well. Federal flood insurance. <clears throat> One of the darlings recently of uh, what's going on in uh, environmental regulation and in saving people. Federal flood insurance is another particularly applicable example here. In the 1950s, the federal government created a subsidized program to provide flood insurance to lessen the losses of citizens who resided at that time in floodplains, coastal homes, low-lying areas in the United States, etc. The federal flood insurance legislation was passed with many references in the Federal Register to a moral obligation to help those devastated by natural forces supposedly beyond our control. Now, I think you'd probably agree with me logically that most natural disasters, flooding, hurricanes, tornadoes, we kind of emotionally agree that that's probably beyond our control and we should help our fellow man with that. <laughs> However, the secondary effects of that behavior produce a moral hazard. The subsidies for this insurance in the FEMA program has caused many more people to build new dwellings in floodplains particularly along the coast. It subsidizes the construction by developers in floodplains of converting floodplains into residential housing and recreational areas. And eventually the losses in that program have gone way, way up in coastal areas, not down. Today you see this program act, uh, actively advertised on the Weather Channel at taxpayer expense, trying to get more people to join the program. Now, if it's subsidized and it's worthwhile, then why would you have to market it? Well, the most interesting point regarding the FEMA flood insurance program is that it's losing money because 
of the repeat losses in the program. Federal data indicate that of the approximately 90,000 affected properties, about 90,000 properties in, in the program, 300 buildings with multiple consecutive losses, that's less than one-tenth of one percent of the insured base, one-tenth of the pro one-tenth of one percent of the properties, account for more than two-thirds of all the flood payment payments in the entire program. The average loss is six events, losing the same house six times. And the top 45 hurricane queens, as FEMA refers to them, have been lost an average of 15 times, 15 consecutive times. And the current record in the United States is 21 consecutive losses of the same property. Now some of you may have seen John Stossel's CBS News special reporting on his own loss at federal expense and the repeated losses after he rebuilt and sold his vacation home on Fire Island in New York. Most of those homes in Fire Island have been rebuilt at your expense. Well, since these homes are insured at replacement value rather than cost, there is a definite moral hazard here. That is, there's a genuine incentive to get a new house at taxpayer expense with each new storm season or each few storm seasons. Now, primarily because not only has the program stimulated excessive risk and high, uh, excessive risk, excessive building and high risk floodplains, but also because federal disaster relief has become much easier to acquire and pays higher returns than flood insurance, many individuals now build in floodplains and do not bother to take out the federal flood insurance, which is why they're trying to broaden the base and sell more of it on the Weather Channel. These individuals rationally rely instead on the pursuit of federal disaster relief. Gee, would you bank on a hurricane or a flood? Obviously, most people are. President Clinton, for example, and I've got a more current example in just a second, but President Clinton actually declared, uh, actually, decla actually declared 14 counties in southern and central Florida disaster areas before the last hurricane of his administration ever struck the coast. Now, as some of you may know, that hurricane never made landfall in Florida, but of course, the disaster relief was distributed anyway, and Bill Clinton stumped around through Florida, making the statement that you folks ought to get some of this relief. We've seen our own current president, President Obama, hopping all over the United States, chasing floods in the Northeast, tornadoes in the Northeast, uh, giving out federal disaster relief below the threshold, below the legal threshold. The regulations state that you've got to have a million dollars worth of loss in order to qualify for federal disaster relief. Fre uh, President Obama has been bouncing around the country saying, well, this is a special case and executing an executive order. Now, that's not to be surprising and that's not political at all in terms of one party or the other because he learned that trick from George W and Bill Clinton and the presidents before him, that the threshold for the giving away of federal disaster relief has just plummeted. Um, <clears throat> if you think that, that that might be a stretch, uh, I have extraordinary good fortune to point out to you some great timing here. Today, the feature story on the front page of USA Today, Disaster Strains FEMA Resources, is precisely about what we're talking about in here today and uses precisely the same logic and explanation. The agency is going bankrupt and cannot therefore actually fund genuine disaster in the, because we have so many political giveaways and mismanagement of the program. Okay. So, we know that there's been, hu the, that the secondary human response to FEMA and federal disaster relief is to put more people into floodplains. Well, most interestingly, where do you think that the vast majority, that is 68% of drowning deaths attributable to flash flooding occurs? Doesn't take a genius to figure that out. It occurs in floodplains, and the, uh, and the logic of this is obvious. What does it take to produce a drowning death due to flash flooding? It takes a person in a floodplain. The more people you put in floodplains, the more deaths you're going to have. So the more you help them, the more you're going to kill them. It's just that simple. Finally, 
another poster child for this process. Coast Guard attempts to rescue boaters has encouraged more boaters to venture farther out to sea under increasing bad weather conditions and use more marginal equipment to do so every year. This eventually results in more lives lost and increased political appeals to increase rescue attempts. Now today, the U.S. Coast Guard is rescuing one boater every eight minutes, when only a decade ago, 10 years ago, that number was one an hour. And two decades ago, that number was one a day. And the number of non-emergent Coast Guard calls has risen from about one per week 20 years ago to about one every hour today. The term non-emergent is Coast Guard code for sailors who call for help implying an emergency when they are simply becalmed, that's no wind, and therefore not getting back towards shore in time for their 6 p.m. cocktails, imply an emergency and ask to be towed. I've got some more details on that in fact, but this phenomenon extends far beyond the Coast Guard. So let's take a look at rescue attempts, many of which occur right here in Colorado. You pay for your own mistakes. That's what I'd like to say to all of you people who take dumb risks and expect the rest of us to pay for your stupidity. Check out over right now. Most every day, rescuers take heroic risks to save someone, somewhere in America. The rescuers helicopter hikers off Grand Canyon ledges. Surfers out of the Pacific. Mountaineers stranded on snow-capped mountains. Sometimes rescuers trying to help others put their own lives on the line. When climbers on Mount Hood fell into a crevasse, a military helicopter flew to the rescue and it crashed. And we're watching a rescue okay. of a rescue. They even risk their lives to save people who want to kill themselves, like the man who tried to drive his minivan off this cliff, but then got stuck. Often the rescued are adventurers who are in trouble because they took foolish risks. Uh, I fell down the hill. I really don't know what happened, but I, I luckily got stopped by a tree before I fell off. Some hike into treacherous weather like this with no warm clothing. The only way out? by helicopter on a stretcher. The internet is crammed with examples of risky behavior. Some people go biking on the edge of a mountain. Be careful, that's a helmet. Oh, 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 oh my god. Oh, no. <laughs> there you go, first fish. Oh, yeah, look at that. <laughs> Even mundane sports are treacherous if people are careless. Every winter, people go ice fishing in Lake Erie. On this day, a TV crew went along as this group and an airboat went over this crack in the ice. Yeah, that's a crack that's always there every year that never heals up real good, so that's why we use airboats, so you can go home at night and see your kids. But most of the fishermen didn't use airboats. They went out on four-wheelers or by foot. That's risky if the wind were to open that crack in the ice. We see a big colony of guys that took their four-wheelers out here in a wind like this. That's not really a smart thing to do. Like that crack's gonna get bigger and bigger as the day goes on. It sure did, just a few hours later. The crack that we came across is now 20 feet of open water. So how are all those fishermen going to get back? 911, where's your emergency? There's a 50 foot gap between the crack and the shoreline. There's probably 500 guys out there still. So. 21 government agencies responded to the rescue request. The good news, no one drowned. And the fishermen were happy. This is what it's all about right here. But hadn't they taken a foolish risk? This morning the ice looked bad going out. A lot of people said we wasn't going to go out, you know. When everything looked bad, we decided to go out anyhow. I'm a little bit upset right now with what I see going on. Sheriff Bob Bratton was angry that people ignored the weather. There's no section of the law about stupidity because they could all be arrested today for that. But Randy Hayes defends taking his four-wheeler onto the ice. You take a chance every time you go out there. But on this day, there was that strong offshore wind. There's wind, there's cracks. It's just something that we deal with. You're tying up emergency services. A helicopter that'll be coming over by Coast Guard, $4,000 an hour. The rescue cost more than a quarter million dollars. Sheriff says you guys should pay if you get rescued. I'm, I'm not for paying. I'm not for paying if you're lost in the woods. And this is America, and I believe that you know we all jump up, we help each other. Why shouldn't people pay? 
It costs money to have a rescue. It costs money to bring in the Coast Guard. We already pay that in the tax dollars that we pay. If you start charging people, people won't call when they truly do need help. Have a good day, guys. Have a good Thank you. I learned later that that's bunk. New Hampshire still gets calls for rescues, even though it charges reckless people. Since 1999, we've been billing people, and they keep calling. Maybe other places should charge, because why should taxpayers have to pay the cost of rescuing people who do such stupid things? I'm gonna pass out, I swear to God. Okay, buddy! This rock climber got tangled in ropes, probably because he was drunk, according to the Yosemite park ranger who rescued him. Would you be foolish enough to go into this Tennessee cave without gear to pull yourself back up? These young men did, and they got stuck. I think it was the thrill of going down in the hole and not thinking about getting back up. Finally, John Rushenberg, the reckless risk taker, he paraglided. Got it. Nice on. launch. Skis off the trail and takes difficult hikes. In Moab, Utah, he hiked up this canyon. This time last year and camped right by the Colorado River. Then suddenly I was, I was stuck. He was reckless, as Sheriff Jim Nyland, and he should pay for his rescue. Well, I mean, he had sandals on, you know, and I believe they were thongs that he had on. They were, John admits. I was hiking in flip-flops. He thinks it's funny. <laughs> this county started charging for rescues after spending $5,000 to pull this Jeep out of that crack in the canyon. They did it to protect local taxpayers because this is a sparsely populated county. But they have a hundred rescues a year because tourists come here for the extreme sports. I'm from North Carolina. Montreal. Sacramento. They take all kinds of risks. It's absolutely fun. It's just an absolute rush every time. And some need to be rescued. I mean, you know, I'm looking at the local taxpayer. You know, when people go out and do ridiculous things, I mean, I think they ought to be held accountable. So they went after John. We billed him $2,000 and he has not paid as of this day. I don't want to pay my bill. John wanted to talk to the sheriff about it. Hi. How are you? Good. Got some good shoes on today. Yes, I do. <laughs> we were there when they met. I never placed a call. I never I know, asked. Well, you asked somebody call. to call. You called her down that you needed help. I find it odd that you have no right to refuse when you can self rescue. The sheriff had an answer for that. Well, you couldn't self rescue. And Is get this it wasn't John's first time. A few years back, he and his friends had to be helped off this mountain. John was... Hungover. <laughs> and uh, we, had, we had problems from the start. <laughs> but we had a great time. The sheriff still hasn't gotten his money. Hopefully people watching want to chip in. Well, I hope so too. <laughs> oh, give me a break. Why should other people chip in to pay for people who bring it on themselves? They should take responsibility for the costs they impose on others. That was an extraordinarily promising piece of video that we had uh, uh, put together and assisted John Stossel in doing. It comes out of research that was first published by Dwight Lee and myself in 1996 concerning mountain climbing on Mount McKinley. But it demonstrates that, in fact, as, you, uh, as we rescue more and more people, eventually people take more and more risks and they impute this supposed risk uh, reduction into their behavior. Well, that's not to say that I'm opposed to rescuing people. I'm a mountaineer myself, a pilot, a scuba diver, a, a hang glider, all those kinds of things and enjoy that. But the point that I want to make there is that in public rescue policy, there is a necessity to set limits as in all policy undertaken with, with federal dollars. I think, for example, most everyone would agree with me that in the absence of knowing where you come out in the distribution of human abilities, if you were behind the Rawlsian veil of ignorance, you didn't know whether you were born uh, brilliant or mentally deficient, blind, or a, sk a skilled athlete, you would in fact consider it logical to vote for some system of public assistance that helps those who are truly needy to assist the truly blind or the truly deficient or whatever. I think you would probably agree that in the absence of knowing whether you were going to be hurt or not, that in fact you would 
support the idea of public rescues, that there is some need to provide rescues. is what we have police for. It's what we have the Coast Guard for and things like that. But in fact, all of these efforts need to be governed by managerial operational rules that are non-political in nature because each has the ability to bankrupt the nation and we certainly are engaging in them at that level as documented by the, uh, the USA Today story. So uh, in summary then, formulating public policy that considers opportunity costs, the effects of regulations on living standards and secondary human responses can save the most lives with limited resources. Careful consideration of the costs and benefits of environmental regulations has the potential not only to reduce costs, but also to save more lives and produce a morally superior alternative. If we have a moral obligation to save lives at any cost, then surely we have a moral obligation to save as many lives as possible. And finally, we should beware of creating moral, we should beware of arguing in, in favor of moral imperatives, because moral imperatives almost always imply moral hazards. And in trying to save every single life, we do indeed kill more people than is necessary. So with that, I will thank you for your attention and be happy to answer any questions that you have. And uh, for the skeptical, provide uh, specific citations for any and all of the stats that I've been able to share with you today. You might wonder why we have, for example, an Altrazine Alcor drinking water standard that costs billions and saves one life, or a uranium mills tailing rule that costs millions and saves one life. It's because they're driven by political special interests, and as long as we're giving out the goodies, we're going to take up some inefficient special interest in the process. Yes. Question. Yeah, you take, the prob you take the probability of a life being saved by reducing that level of the specific uh, environmental threat and spread it over a normal distribution, uh, evaluate the probability that a life will be cost, lost, and compare it against the total expenditures to save that life. Um, these are pretty well established um, actuarial equations, uh, first developed by insurance companies and others, but it's been broadened much more now into the environmental area. Important point to keep in mind, however, though, the opportunity cost of any choice is the value of the highest valued foregone alternative. It's not all other possible foregone alternatives. It's the highest valued one. So it's not the sum of them. It is only what one of them that you would have to give up because you can't simultaneously have all of them, okay? You hear testimony, you hear experts coming up in front of Congress when lobbying for budgets or special interest allocations or those kinds of things who get those numbers confused a lot of the time. Now these, these numbers that I presented today are kind of the poster children uh, in this area, but there's, there's enough of them to get your attention and make you understand that an awful lot of what comes up in front of Congress and state legislatures as well is uh, pretty nonsensical. Yes? Sir. So when you say the opportunity cost is 10 lives to save the one life, um, put it away, I don't know what for, but uh, that's the dollar amount that they put on the life, and if it costs like okay. $100 million, then. For example, the EPA might estimate that. The Altrazine Alcor drinking water standard might save one life per year. Right. Okay. Considering that it costs 100. Yeah, yeah, the compliance cost of uh, how many, however many millions divided by 7.5 million, which, which is, that's, which is uh, no, the 7.5 million is the uh, cost of regulation that produces the statistical loss of one year life. If you, you, you assess $7.5 million worth of regulatory costs on an economy, that reduces living standards enough to produce one statistical loss of life. 
one person at the margin, someone losing a, a year on the end of their life due to whatever environmental uh, issue you're dealing with, like um, air quality, for example. Lower air quality, older people die younger. Emphysema, things like that. Or people who already have emphysema uh, die earlier, those types of things. Have any studies been done for developing countries? Just oh, yeah, yeah, as a matter of fact. Now, that's, that's really interesting. This is really cool. Um, as this, this body of theory is developed in the United States, it's been picked up in a lot of developing countries who have different incentives than we have, of course. For example, um, uh, a, a, uh, an associate of mine was attending the summit uh, in... in um, what was it, the, the big uh, environmental summit uh, in Brazil? Yeah, they had a big environmental uh, summit meeting of the, the G7 countries uh, in Brazil about 10 years ago, uh, where they were addressing America's willingness to try to get developing countries not to develop, basically, uh, slash and burn. Uh, agriculture in third world countries supposedly is reducing the carbon sink, uh, the ability to, for, for uh, trees to absorb uh, uh, the carbon issue. And subsequently the idea that uh, America was wanting to encourage developing nations not to engage in, for example, slash and burn uh, farming. Uh, in the, a colleague of mine arrived at this, this meeting and was riding to the meeting in a cab and the cab driver asked him if he was going to the summit and he said yes we're going to the summit to talk about uh, slash and burn agriculture that uh, in fact it uh, plays a role on uh, lung cancer and um, certainly it's not, not good for, for people and the cab driver responded immediately with lung cancer most of us in this country would like to live long enough to get lung cancer. What we want to do is get enough to eat so that we can live long enough to acquire lung cancer. It's a luxury. So these studies are very valuable and they're being replicated in foreign countries, but it's not surprising to me, although it is surprising to many others who don't uh, study economics, that developing countries are not as sensitive to environmental hazards as we are. As a matter of fact, they make the exact opposite argument. They want to say, if you don't want us, they want to say to the United States, if you don't want us to develop, surely you should compensate us. All you're doing is telling us that you don't want us to do what you've already done. You created the pollution. <laughs> you have created the industrialized country, you have a higher standard of living, we want some too. If you don't want us to have that, you should compensate us, which is a, not an unreasonable argument to make. It's one that we're not willing to do as a nation very much yet, but that's true. Yes. From uh, you know, lobbying, uh, lobbying and special interests in Washington, do you feel from an ethical standpoint uh, that the greatest good is really what politicians are striving for? No. No. As a matter of fact, uh, as an economist, I would contend that there are no more saints or sinners in the public sector than there are in the private sector. They're motivated by their own self-interest, and that does not necessarily have to be bad. Okay, let me, let me address that for just a second. Your self-interest means that you want to do what you think is best and what you satisfies you the most. That doesn't mean that you don't want to care for other people. Human beings are born into this world with a need to care for other people. Most of you, anybody in here want to admit they don't care for their mother? How many of you don't care whether your mother lives or dies? Okay. People care. You care more about those close to you, more of those that you have an exchange with and interaction with, than someone else. For example, you're a hundred times more likely to try to rescue a, an infant child drowning in a wading pool than you are at the head of the Yosemite Falls or Niagara Falls. Human beings react by weighing off the costs and benefits. So people in Washington have a preference function just like you do. 
and they want to get reelected. They want to do the job that they do. And every one of them would tell you, I get my greatest degree of satisfaction out of serving the people, helping the people, doing what's good for the people. Now, how true that is, that varies from person to person, just like it varies as to how much you happen to like your mother or whatever, sometimes more than others. The older she gets, maybe more, maybe less, but it changes over time. But the politicians and lobbyists and bureaucrats would all tell you that, in fact, they're doing what they believe is right for themselves. A special interest is just that. It is a narrowly defined, focused special interest, which really doesn't have all that much concern with the well-being of other special interests and the greatest good for the greatest number. If I were a lobbyist, I would, if, if, I, if I was a lobbyist for the, uh, for the uh, uranium mining industry, I would be lobbying against the, the, uranium, tailing, the, the uranium mill tailings regulatory uh, legislation. If I was a government legislator that got paid to do that, I would be making the case for, in fact, we've got to protect people from uranium tailings. Exactly how much, that's another question. Big issue there. A lot of universities are now being given properties for free, but they got to clean up because of the environmental regulations. The University of Tennessee was given four uh, properties which were previously occupied by gasoline stations. Well, of course, you got to clean that up, and the requirements for that, the environmental regulations, for an old gasoline station in Tennessee, you have to remove more lead. You've got to, you've got to get all the lead out of the, the property and the dirt altogether. There has to be less lead on that dirt, on that property, than exists in a box of weedy cereal based upon the kinds of studies that many uh, of these regulations are developed around. For example, on the lead study, you've probably heard a lot about lead-based paints and kids eating dirt and stuff like that. Well, it's true. They actually assess how much lead a child would take in by eating three tablespoons, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm off on that, three teaspoons, just eating three teaspoons of dirt every day until they're no longer a child, okay? It's just like rat studies, you understand? You, you, you look, at the, look at the kind of studies that are done on rats in the, in the medical world, they start with doses of chemicals that are the size of the rat's body weight, so to speak. So many of these things just don't make sense, but as they grind through the political process, they do. In the stimulus bill that just was passed, last two years ago, year and a half ago. An enormous number of projects that were, quote, shovel-ready in Tennessee. That means that they've been turned down for the last 15 years as nonsense. Just went into the pipeline and we got, we got huge new airports in places in Tennessee where there are no airplanes. You understand? Little airports in little towns out in rural Tennessee. They got a 5,000, 7,000 foot runway 60 inches deep. A 60-inch runway is for carrying transport planes. But, you know, it just happened to be there, and it gets through the political process. But no, I don't think that they're, they're concerned with the greatest good for the greatest number. Supposedly, that's what politicians are supposed to do, way off the greatest good for the greatest number. But when confronted with special interests which have concentrated votes, contributions, and political power in their hand, they don't necessarily do it. Yes, sir. So, in pursuit of coming up with viable uh, ways of providing, say, rescue services or flood insurance, um, obviously there, there's well documented well hazard, and it seems like there's some sort of a expectations problem there. But is there a way to find uh, an equilibrium? Is there a level of rescue services that provides more benefit than harm, or is it always? Well, of course, that's got to be a, a theoretical question because, you know, if, you're, if there's an optimum number of rescues, we could only assess that over a large-scale experiment. But we can knock out the poster children. 
And there's a number of very simple things that we can do. For example, in our article on mountain climbing in Mount McKinley, all we suggested was that, in fact, people who want to take, undertake obvious high-risk situations. Now, McKinley is an extreme peak. The number of people qualified to get up to the top of that peak is very small, but it grows every year. In an area like that, if you want to do that, simply being required to take out an insurance policy or a bond of some type so that if we got to come get you, we got to spend $200,000, which is the average rescue cost on that mountain. If we got to spend $200,000 to come get you, that the public is going to be reimbursed from that, uh, for that in some way by an insurance policy or a bond or something. However, can't do that because there is a specific binding federal regulation that prohibits charging for rescues in federal parks. Now, because we didn't get to it in the, in the um, Stossel video, it may interest you to know that there are states that do charge for rescues. Vermont and New Hampshire for two. And since they started doing that in the early 90s, the number of people that they've had to rescue has dropped significantly. It doesn't mean that they don't rescue people, but it does mean that if you do something stupid, that in fact you're going to pony up enough to get your attention. The, the, we had an example of a guy named John Rushenberg who was uh, hiking in Moab, Utah in flip-flops and got himself into a situation where, because he was drunk and hung over, self-admittedly did so, that he had to be rescued and they billed him for $2,000 and he refused to pay. Um, the interview process would il illustrate to you just how wacky some people that do these things are. And I guess I would have to admit that in my history I've probably done some wacky things too. But I think that being responsible for them, at least to the public, at some extreme level is something we can do something about. Just like when you weigh off one life for the uranium uh, male tailings rule versus its cost, it's easy to say, we don't want to do that. It's just not worth it. Taking the extreme cases. Uh, other things that uh, could, uh, could go a long way is simply stop, uh, for example, in the federal flood insurance program, it doesn't make any sense to buy somebody this house over and over again 21 times at federal expense. Somewhere along the line, we should say, this is the last time we're buying this house for you. You understand? You don't get 21 new houses. You only get 15 or 7 or 6. Or, fool, you should not be here. Get out of here. Pay them, buy the property, condemn the property. You know, governments do that all the time. We condemn people's properties, rightly or wrongly, and, de and demolish buildings things like that, there's nothing that would uh, prohibit limiting the federal flood insurance program and then stop using the federal disaster relief as a political favor. I mean, the presidents want to fly into an area with the news media and stand up there and say that you people are hurting and we want to help you, even though you don't qualify. <laughs> it, it, it supposedly gains votes. But that's just not the way to run a country, and it's not the way to, to help people. Yes? Um, this is more of a comment than a question, but I remember reading somewhere about um, airbag or seatbelt data, airbag or seatbelt study, um, and I think it was seatbelts, where they said the amount of deaths went up, but the amount of violent injuries went down. Post Actually, I've seen two numbers about that, and by the way, that's an important co comparison. It's seat belts, not airbags. Airbags are losers from day one. Seat belts are inexpensive and, in fact, have a much more positive history. But you're right that in recent years that the actual uh, distribution between injuries and deaths has changed. People are driving faster. There is some secondary effect to seat belts. But they're, they're much more effective as deterrents than the, than the airbag itself. One reason, by the way, this is kind of interesting, but one reason that the airbag is of such little deterrence is that most people are already wearing their seatbelt. 
the seat belt is the primary deterrent. It's a low-hanging fruit argument. That is, you can get most of the improvement in a situation with the inexpensive early logical gains. It's chasing that last marginal benefit that is most costly and you get the least benefit from. That's a concept in economics we refer to as diminishing marginal utility, diminishing returns, et cetera. And the same, it's the same argument that we're trying to make here in terms of trying to save everybody. It's impossible to save everybody. Trying to save everybody can kill a lot more people than is necessary. So put placing some limits on them. Of course, it's, that's very, very hard to do, to live up to. I mean, how many of you are willing to run for office on a uh, platform of, I'm going to let some hikers freeze to death out there on the mountainside? It's not going to get you a lot of yes. um, So how far back do you think we should scale things like our traffic safety regulations? I mean, should we take out all of our traffic control signals? There are places in the world that don't have any of these things and also have very low accident rates. <laughs> That's an interesting point, and he's, he's quite right about that, by the way. There are some, if any of you have ever uh, been in China or, uh, or the other opposite, Singapore, the enormous degree of personal coordination there is astonishing. Of course, they, they, they do have a lot, of, uh, a lot of injury and death there as well, but there are some small, unique situations where people coordinate their own behaviors without streetlights, without, in many instances, coercive police forces and things like that. But these are small, confined, and extremely homogeneous societies, not diverse societies. That's, that, that, that's a problem. Yes, sir. Uh, how much are progressive attitudes factored into these statistical oh, speculations? How much are what? How much are these? How much um, are progressive attitudes uh, factored into these statistical speculations? Like, um, for instance, the car example. Um, people go faster because there's more safety, but it creates more future opportunities and a better standard of living. Ah. Excellent, excellent question. Excellent. He's, he's making a, a, a really kind of a complex economic argument. He says, how much are progressive attitudes involved in these car safety issues? What he's saying is that, okay, um, if people impute safety devices into their driving behavior and they go faster, and they have more accidents, you can, you can make that argument that safety devices can produce more injury or death. But what he's saying is, how does the fact that they are also chasing more opportunities weigh into this? And in fact, I've heard discussions of that idea before, the, pot, the benefit side of safety legislation and the benefit side of speed limits. Remember when we dropped the speed limits down to 55, there was a strong argument that it has an enormous cost that we're not only burning more fuel, but people can't get, it, get to places as fast, they can't do as much, we're not as efficient at working at alternatives. And I have not seen any really effective, well-designed studies that examine that, but that's a, that's a very interesting question. It's a very perceptive question for a student um, because that's what economists do. You weigh off the costs and the benefits, and there are always undefined and nebulous benefits, and there are always undefined and nebulous costs. The more accurately you can define each, the more accurately you can make a proper decision, an effective decision. That was, that was a good point. Now, well, surely I can stir you up more than this. Doesn't anybody want to squabble here? <laughs> All righty. Well, thank you very much.